So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Fiona Tomley and I'm the uh, director of the GCRF One Health Poultry Hub. Um, this is the fifth panel in our roadmap series uh, entitled Discussions for the Future of Poultry, People and Planet. Uh, these fortnightly discussions address key issues for sustainable development from the perspective of nutrition security and the global poultry industry. And through this series, we aim to contribute to the UN call that we build back better from the COVID-19 pandemic for the future we want. Um, so today's discussion will last for one hour. The event is being recorded and will be available on the One Health Poultry Hub website. A direct, direct link to that recording will be sent to all registered attendees. Um, please put your questions to the panel through the Zoom Q&A function, which you can access at the bottom of your screens. Um, if English is not your first language, please don't let this stop you from asking questions. Don't be put off by that. Uh, we're happy to take questions uh, in whatever form they come. Um, I will put as many of your questions as I can to the panelists uh, in the Q&A session. Um, if your question is covered in a previous answer or if we run out of time, then please accept my apologies that you might not be mentioned. Uh, we have an online discussion channel which is linked to this uh, event. You can access that from the website or from your registration link. Uh, and you can explore this to share your questions. <laughs> um, the discussions will, con con apologies, that's my dog, uh, will contribute to a series of briefing notes we'll be preparing from this series. So today's discussion is about poultry production, keeping the customer satisfied. And our panelists will debate issues around the different types of poultry production systems that work in different settings and can contribute to resilient food security and safety. And we'll consider also what makes chickens feel content and safe. But first, we'd welcome your thoughts on the topic today via the first poll, which is now onto your screens. Um, it will disappear when you vote. Um, just for the tape. Um, the question is, do consumers in your country know how poultry meat and eggs are produced? And you can say yes, consumers are generally knowledgeable and well informed, or no, consumers have little interest in finding out where their food comes from, or three, partly, consumers are interested but they may get their information from unreliable sources. Okay, so I'm now delighted to welcome our panelists for today. Um, if you'd like to put your screens up, yeah. So uh, Apollina Jikeng is Professor of Tropical Agriculture and Sustainable Development and Director of the Centre for Tropical Livestock Genetics and Health at the University of Edinburgh. This is a global partnership uh, that aims to deliver genetic gains for improved livestock productivity in tropical climates. Welcome Apollina. Uh, he's in Washington at the moment, so he's up very early in the morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Christine Nicholl is an author, an academic and a researcher. She's the Professor of Animal Welfare at the Royal Veterinary College and has honorary appointments also in Oxford and Lincoln. She's internationally recognised for her work on animal welfare, and that includes significant amounts of work in both layer and broiler chicken. So welcome, Christine. We're looking forward to your contribution. So each of you has got 10 minutes to present your thoughts. Um, there is a timer on your slide, so at nine minutes that will go red and you have a minute to warm up, so uh, to wrap up, sorry. So uh, with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to Apollina to give the first talk. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, and hello, everyone. Many thanks for your, uh, for your participation today. Um, I want to also thank Robin and other colleagues on the One Health Poultry for this kind of invitation. Going by the running title, Building Back and Building Better, I want to echo a well-known saying that in a crisis, you shouldn't waste it. And I think our discussion today is to see how we could use the current crisis to build back and fight some of the issues that we're all facing. Can, can I go to the next slide, please? We all know that the poultry sector is global it is mature and also very strong. The poultry sector is well embedded in the private sector fabric and is also well supported by the, in some cases by the public sector. My remarks will be biased towards the public sector and also biased uh, towards um, low and middle income countries. 
We therefore should ensure that it, the poultry sector is effectively harnessed to deliver social economic and other benefits to relevant beneficiaries. And the question is always, who are the beneficiaries? Can we effectively identify them? Can we measure how much impact we're having on them? And the reality is that we haven't succeeded in using the poultry sector effectively to, to do that. And they are nonetheless excellent initiatives. I think some of them may have been highlighted throughout this series. And towards the end of this, I'll have the opportunity to touch on one or two things that we are doing. It is always good to go back and see where we have come from. I use this USDA uh, chart on the table here to see the global trend and the important points that uh, this slide gives us. One is the demand for poultry products is always increasing and will continue to increase in the foreseeable future. Of course, that's related to the increasing population. How can we meet that demand? You know, it's really projected. And the demand for consumption is actually everywhere, whether you're in advanced economies and low, eco low income economies, you, you, you we can see the, 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 the demand. And the question here is how do we meet that? If you look at this uh, graph here, you will see that in Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East and also Southeast Asia, the importation is actually expected to increase. Then the key question is how do we then balance local production versus imports? Because I think in looking at that, we can actually see who are the consumers, who do we need to satisfy? Can I go to the next slide, please? I also want to recognize that, um, and, you, uh, and I hope many of you agree that poultry has an important role to play in our food systems. And the food systems are quite complex. Regardless of where you are, we have to understand them better so that they can be resilient, they can deliver, and they can also um, sustainably produce for um, uh, and, and meet uh, emerging challenges. How, do we understand the food system? To some extent, we understand them, but we've always generalized them. And there are, key important, there are many important parameters that we have to uh, consider when we come to the food systems. And the more we understand this, the more we can understand who are we actually producing, in this case, poultry to satisfy. And the growing population is one of the things. Sustainable production with less impact on the environment is also another important challenge that the food system uh, uh, face. Safe food, nutritious, and also impacting those who are most vulnerable is, an is, is also an important consideration. On this map here, we have the, hungry ma the hunger map for 2020. And we see here that Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia are really vulnerable. And yet we're expected and there are possibilities for poultry to be produced in those areas. How can we do that? Earlier on, there was a case of a lot of poultry production in India, but in the same area, you have a lot of uh, malnutrition. How can we deliver, how can we balance that? And I think this is where I want to echo that some of these are wicked problems in nutrition. And these are problems that do require non-conventional solutions to address them. And I think that's one of the things that we have to address here. Next slide, please. And from the consumers and producers perspective, it is important to examine the key driver for poultry production. Often for poultry as, an, as, a, as another animal agriculture product, producers so, uh, do so for themselves, for their communities, and essentially, the, 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 the argument I'm making here is a lot of what is produced is for local consumption. How do we, how do we make that? Can I go to, in, still on this slide, sorry. And I think when we are looking at the drivers, we, we have to consider safety of, of, uh, of, of what is produced. What is the, the value chain from production transformation and ending up on the plates of those who, has to, who have to consume it. And we should also be anticipating some of the drivers for the production to be, in, to be sure that we are actually meeting the, 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 the uh, anticipating some of the, the, the problems. And finally, on this slide here, I want to look at poultry as an important parameter or a component of a food system or a production system where we are also likely going to have other, other livestock commodities. In a situation where we have pig system, for instance, we have to be very careful 
not for pigs to become the mixing vessel and transmitting influenza and stuff like that. There are many other things that we can talk about the production system, looking at the driver to ensure that it's this safe. Can I go to the next slide, please? So production system in sub-Saharan Africa are not homogeneous. On this slide here, I'm using the example of Ethiopia, a country where through the work in the center with partners at the International Livestock Research Institute at Nottingham University, we're looking at different production system. And what we've been able to do here is really to understand what are the drivers, social economic drivers, but what's also the drivers in the agro systems? What is the temperature? What is the disease pressure? What is also the importance and of social, uh, social, uh, social considerations? Can I go to the next slide, please? On this one here is really the, the key thing to highlight here is the power of putting data together. And what we've <clears throat> been done here is really uh, doing niche modeling uh, uh, to, to ensure that we understand what is needed and how we could uh, support the farmers to make decisions and focusing on harnessing genetic diversity uh, uh, available locally. And, and, and I should also mention here that what I was not able to really bring onto here is the assessment of genetic diversity in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. We have used molecular markers and other phenotypic characterization to see the extent of diversity. And the key question here is what are the things that we can do to sort of harness that, uh, that diversity? And on this slide here, there is a lot of information um, from, from Ethiopia. And we have demonstrated that whether you're in high altitude, middle altitude or low altitude, the disease pressure, the production system, the farmer preference and consumer preferences are also well understood. And this can support some of the decision that can be made. Let me leave it here and thank you so much. Thanks very, very much, Apollo. That was great. And I really like how you've emphasized the, the balance uh, between local production uh, import and the, bal the balances everywhere and the trade-offs. I think that's really important and uh, the fact that this is a wicked problem. I'd like, um, we've got a minute or two, I'd really like it if you could expand a little bit on your final point. So you talk about, um, you know, that you're, you're assessing diversity of poultry locally, you're using all of these genomic approaches. Can you just give us a picture for, you know, maybe in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, how much has been assessed? How much of that genetics is preserved? And what are the options for its use? How do you move forward with the genetics? Thank you, Fiona. <clears throat> uh, through the work by uh, Africa Union Interbureau um, uh, Animal Genetic Resources, AUIBA, diversity of poultry and many other um, uh, livestock uh, have been characterized. And there have been um, uh, establishment of different gene bank and linked to that some of the work that is being done or has been done through the Rosalind Institute um, by Dr. Mike McGrew has been to establish the primordial germ cells that can actually be used for cryopreservation. And I would say that that technology exists is now being used to cryo uh, to, to cryo preserve some of these elite uh, ecotypes, and we've also demonstrated that you can cryo preserve them and bring them back to surrogate host to re uh, to reconstitute whole birds, and that is going to have a significant impact, in not only in preservation but also utilization to drive productivity, and also be able to develop uh, ecotypes that will. Uh, help to adapt to, to climate change on all other emergency uh, um, uh, challenges in the production system. Fantastic. It sounds like there's huge progress and lots of optimism there. Um, before I move on to the next talk, I think we probably can put up the results of the first poll. Yes. OK. So here we have the, the question, do consumers in your country know how poultry meat and eggs are produced? Very interesting. 18% of people think that uh, consumers are knowledgeable about the same number, 14% think people have no interest. And actually, for the most part, the, the audience view is that consumers are interested, but they get their information from unreliable sources. So that's very interesting and food for thought, I think. I don't know if you have a, a quick comment on that, either of you. Hello? 
I'll comment later, Christine. I'll comment later, okay, that's fine. Good, thank you. Okay, in that case, um, I'm gonna move. Uh, thank you very much, Apollinaire. Uh, and now move to uh, Christine to deliver her talk. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real privilege. Uh, so my talk is about keeping customers satisfied. And that's a particularly challenging task because there's no such thing as an average customer. If we want to understand more about people's demands and desires around poultry production, we need to think about consumers, but also non-consumers, people who have opted out of eating poultry products for one reason or another, and we need to recognize that people are individuals with their own complicated backgrounds and reasons for making their eating decisions. Given this, we might expect a huge diversity of opinion about chicken welfare, but in Europe at least, there's remarkable consistency. Large scale Eurobarometer surveys have been conducted in many years looking at samples of 30,000 people to ask about their views on farm animal welfare. And in Europe, nearly all respondents think that farm animals should be better protected. For example, in 2006, 36% thought farm animal welfare was of the highest possible importance. And 10 years later, by 2016, that had increased to 57%. But there was also general agreement in both surveys that of all farmed animal species, chickens experienced the worst welfare and were the most in need of further protection. So it's safe to say that Europeans are far more united on chicken welfare than on any other issue. But if we go a little bit deeper into these results, it's interesting to note that concern for chicken welfare in Europe is not affected by rural living or urban living or political views. There's a minor influence of gender with women being a little bit more concerned, but the most important factor associated with a concern for chicken welfare is education level. The other surprising finding is that people with slightly lower household incomes and certainly younger people express far more concern than older and wealthier demographics. So surveys of this kind provide a snapshot, but we need more detailed studies to understand what people mean when they say they want higher welfare products. Analyses show that people are mostly concerned about industrialized agricultural systems. They're concerned about animals being treated as products rather than sentient creatures, and they're concerned that animals are unable to live natural lives. It's also interesting to note that people weigh inherent features of agricultural systems much more highly than risks. So for example, a conventional cage confines every single chicken in a small space allowance, and it doesn't matter how good the husbandry is, nothing can alter that fact, it's inherent to the system. And for many people, such cages are seen as prisons. I'm not over-exaggerating, these are the terms that people use. And then when people are told that the disease risks can be higher in alternative systems, they can understand that, but they still think that cages are the worst system. And they think that because um, they think in a cage, the animal has no chance of a good life. If it's in an outdoor system, it may be at a high risk of disease, but at least it has a chance. So it's interesting to understand people's psychology when they think about these things. And of course, it's easy to discount survey findings because it costs nothing for a respondent to say that they care. But there are other sources of information that back this up. And I'm going to take the example, I'm going to continue the example of cages for laying hens to make this point. I'm going to briefly show how production is moving away, not only from conventional battery cages, but also from enriched cages like the one shown in this picture that provide uh, hens with perches, a little bit more space and a nesting area. And consumers are driving this shift away from all types of cage via many routes. Many consumers have actively gone out shopping and deliberately paid more for cage-free eggs for many years. They will pay up to 50% more. Um, but just as someone may prefer to pay a slightly higher rate of road tax once a year, 
rather than having to pay, pay a toll every time they go on a small road, consumers are getting tired of having to make these frequent point of sale decisions. And retailers, cafes, restaurants are benefiting from this demand by letting customers know that all products in their range are cage free. And that removes the burden for the consumer of checking every packet. Also concerned consumers join lobby groups and charities and lobby for influential politicians to produce legislative change. And this is an ongoing process. Can I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> so bowing to scientific and consumer pressure, conventional cages for laying hens were banned in Europe in 2012, and most producers moved to the enriched cages that I showed on the previous slide, but consumers have never really accepted enriched cages, and so further shifts in production are continuing. In Europe, the proportion of hens in enriched cages in 2012 was over 60%, but now on the left-hand side, you can see that it's 50% and it's dropping. In the United Kingdom, on the top right-hand slide, if you look at the pale green line, in 2012, about half of hens were in free-range systems. Now that's two thirds. And if we look at the United States, starting from a very low base, the proportion of hens in cage-free systems has shifted from virtually nothing in 2012 to over a quarter of production. And similar trends are now being seen in other countries. Next slide, please. More embryonic signs of change and concern come from nearly all regions of the world. <clears throat> Messages about animal welfare can be easily shared by social media and transmit faster than most pathogens. A recent survey of 700 Chinese consumers, shown on the left, found that nearly half now report thinking about animal welfare at least some of the time when they make their purchasing decisions. Whilst in Latin America, the number of retail outlets <coughs> making cage-free commitments is growing rapidly. The slide shows only those retailers that begin with the letter A. Next slide. Now, this all arises because consumers care about hens. It's not cheaper or easier or healthier to keep hens in free range systems. It's actually more expensive. We have to counter consumer misunderstandings. Consumers sometimes are so, um, so attracted by cage free systems that they think that they are better in all respects. And they don't like to hear that avian flu, for example, might be a lower risk in a cage. They just don't really understand it or they don't want to hear it. So there are many trade-offs that we have to address. When we think about backyard flocks or small production systems, there's huge potential to move from point A on this trade-off graph up to point B or point C, where health and productivity are both increased together. But beyond a certain point, improving welfare yet further may start to compromise sustainability or resource efficiency. Next slide, please. So we are going to move to a world of compromises. And in the urban world, in higher income countries, <coughs> the solution that is being landed upon is the development of multi-tier cage-free systems like the one shown on the left here. The production performance in these systems now virtually matches that of cage systems, but the birds are free to move. They may be at a high stocking density, but they are free to move and they can express more of their behavior needs. Consumers like these systems. They don't love them, but they like them. They don't provoke that visceral disgust that consumers feel about cages. So it's worth scanning the horizon. I've talked about hens, I've talked about egg production shifts, but now people are turning their attention to the broiler chicken and meat production. A recent survey showed that 90%, in very recent, last year, 90% of European citizens are now calling for better broiler chicken welfare. They're well aware of some of the problems of leg health and the problems of restricted feeding for broiler breeder birds. Um, how should other countries, lower and middle income countries, respond to these shifting patterns of production in higher income countries? 
I think that the idea is to learn from the mistakes that we have made when we have embraced all out intensification without giving animal welfare a thought. Increasing wealth, education and access to media means that young people globally are uniting against systems that cause animals pain or distress. Lower and middle income countries may be able to leapfrog over our past mistakes. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very, very much, Christine. That was a really great roundup of everything. And, um, you know, the complexities, the inherent complexities, the social complexities, the trade-offs, all of these really difficult questions are, are, are absolutely put there in, in, your, in your talk. And we're getting a lot of questions in. I'd just like to ask you quickly before we move to the, to the open questions, you, you talk about, about uh, welfare, but how do, you, how do we know whether chickens feel pain in the way that we do or or how they experience emotion what what is the science behind this yeah well it would be difficult to say that they experience pain in the same way that we do or emotions in the same way that we do they are birds and they're not humans but we do know that they can experience pain and i'll just give you one example so if you take hens with keel fractures so a fracture of the the bones, the breastbone, which happens quite frequently because laying hens have weak skeletons due to very high egg production. Those keel fractures are painful even when they've healed up. And we know that both because if we give the birds pain killing drugs, analgesic drugs, that restores their mobility. So if they have a keel fracture, they're very reluctant to move up or down from perches give them a pain killing drugs and they move much more easily. But the key point, that's not the point, the key point is that the birds will choose to take those pain killing drugs. They will choose environments in which they've been given pain killing drugs. So that shows that they're making decisions about their own pain. And it means that they notice their own pain. It's not just a, a nociceptive response. It's gone to that higher brain center and they can experience and feel pain. So that's just one example, but there's a lot of animal welfare science that's involved with asking chickens what they want, how much they want it and what they don't want. <laughs> Fascinating, thank you so much. Um, so it's time to throw the, the, the discussion open. We've got quite a few questions that have come in already. So um, we'll, we'll get started, I think. The, the first one uh, that came in actually was one for you, Christine, which was, is from, um, from our colleague uh, Paleja from Gujarat, who asks, um, how is animal welfare and customer satisfaction related? Are they related? So satisfaction yeah. of the customer and the welfare of the animals. Yeah. Thank you very much for that question. That's a really interesting question. So I think that they are related. We know that um, consumers, if they buy something that has a high welfare label on it, they attribute other aspects to that product, whether or not that's correct. So if they buy a high welfare product, they also um, rate that product as being of higher quality, of tasting better. So that's an interesting uh, correlation, whether or not it's actually true in a blind tasting trial. But the other important factor is that as countries have shifted or regions have shifted or supermarkets have shifted to cage free production, the total egg sales are increasing. So it looks like to some extent there was in higher income countries, a suppression of demand with people avoiding eggs some people avoiding eggs and now feel that that's a product that they can come back to and increase. It's a, it's a, a good, healthy, safe, quality product rather than a product that's a bit embarrassing to eat or a bit of a guilty thing to eat. So there's all sorts of interesting psychology going on there. But generally, yes, the two are related. Thank you. Apollo, no, I'm just wondering if, if, if you have any insights into that in, in, in sort of low and middle income countries. Is there a, do you think that there's a link there at all? Or is this not something that you would think is considered in Africa, for example, whether the, the welfare of the animal or, or the, the provenance of the animal links to customer satisfaction? I think there is a link. Um, the link has not classically been there, but with the, um, with the, um, 
the growing demand, the middle class, I think that the, the consumers are, are more and more demanding that you know, the, the product should meet certain expectations. So, but it's growing. Okay, and maybe links to the preference for eating particular types of birds sort of you know, with particular um, taste or, or, or that have been uh, outbred and, 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 and free ranged. Is that something that you think is feasible? Absolutely. Um, in, uh, in Central and West Africa, I mean, throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, there is, um, in, in Kenya, it's called Kinyeji uh, chicken. In West Africa, we call it Pule Bicicle. These are slow-growing chicken free, uh, uh, free range. And, and they're prime products, not only locally, but also um, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in markets in North America and also Europe of African descent who are there. That, that's actually a niche market. And I think the, the, the point in terms of consumer uh, preferences should also be you know, stressed uh, from that particular angle. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll move on because we've got quite a lot of other questions and I kind of come to you, Apollinaire. Um, and, and this is a, a question about, uh, which comes from uh, Rukan Hoke uh, in Bangladesh. And he asks, should poultry producers in low and middle income countries care about consumer choices, needs and preferences in advanced economies? Yeah, the, the, the point I've just made, you know, if, uh, yeah. if you're looking at that kind of niche market, you also have to care. And actually people have been caring on cons uh, producers in sub-Saharan or in low and middle income country and particularly sub-Saharan Africa have been caring. So th that poulet bicycle, it has to meet a certain taste, has to be made certain tenderness and, and things like that. I think those are some of the considerations in, in producing for those markets. I think they should care to answer the question very simply. Yeah, okay. Uh, and a question really to, to, to Christine again, though I think again you might want to comment on it. And uh, this is uh, really to do with um, who should pay. So, you know, you've got consumer perspectives, you've got producer perspectives. Who should pay for the cost of welfare? And this comes from Mahoud Al Fouth. Okay. So I think there's two things to say there. Um, at some level of production, improving welfare will actually decrease costs of production. So if you have small free range flocks, but they're not terribly healthy, um, that perhaps they've got parasites or whatever, simply improving health will also improve welfare and will lower costs. But beyond that, the range that we're talking about today, yes, there will be additional costs of producing beyond the basic minimum standards in, in a battery cage system or the most intensive broiler system. So those costs could be met by consumers, but they one thing I was mentioning there about the, the, the road tax, consumers don't like having to make that choice every single time they go shopping. They don't like having to pay 50% more every single time they buy a product. They would rather that it was taken care of in some other way. So they would rather not have to make the choice. And the supermarkets that have decided we are only going to stock high welfare products are much preferred by consumers. They go in and they don't even have to see the cheaper option, but they choose the supermarket and they choose to shop in that supermarket. The worst thing for the consumer is knowing and being reminded the whole time that they're having to pay for their principles. So that's, that's an interesting point. They want to do it, but they don't want to have to think about it too frequently. There's also the possibility that, um, as in the UK, we're talking about um, paying farmers to produce to higher welfare standards because that is a society demand. So not just paying farmers to produce, but paying farmers to produce to a society driven demand for slightly better welfare. Thank you. I'm going to change tack a little bit um, and, and come to Apollo. This is a question from Hassan bin Aslam, um, who's asking about this, that it's much more to do with socioeconomics and about, about well, about economics of the production. Is the increase in imports that you're refer, referring to import of raw material for poultry feed production and medicine or import of finished poultry products? So you talked in your, you, you mentioned in your talk about increased importation. And he says, sometimes the level of imports are directly re related to the increase in intensification. Do you want to comment on, the, on that? 
it, it's a mix of it's a mix of all those you know finished products and also you know um, other support products to drive local production. Okay, so so raw material for poultry feed production certainly is an issue I know in a in a, in a lot of countries. So. Um, are you aware of, 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 of how that might be being tackled in, in some of the elmics that you're working in for local sources of, of feedstuffs, for example? Uh, and how does that fit in with the, with the genetic gains work? Are there breeds of birds that do better on foraging or do better on particular diets, for example? So <clears throat> nutrition and other uh, aspects of husbandry are very important. And I think uh, the decision that uh, I mentioned earlier, is really considering uh, the total production systems, going from the breeds that you have and also availability of the foodstuff. And feed conversion is also an, an important dimension. So uh, an ideal situation would be where, you know, a production system is self-contained, where smallholder farmers or small producers are relying on available feedstock locally. When you start to import and, and bring a uh, feed from distantly located places, you're immediately increasing the cost of production. That can actually, you know, become a, a major hindrance. Yes. So I think an ideal situation is always to, you know, given the level of intensification, there are several aspects uh, to be considered also. You know, the more you intensify, definitely you have to bring food stuff from, from other places. But in, 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 uh, in, in low production system, uh, um, you, you know, ideal would be to, to rely on fit stuff which is available locally. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna ask a question. Uh, we've got a lot of questions that kind of overlap here. So apologies if some of the questions are partially covered. But this is going back, back to something that Christine mentioned about the shift to cage-free systems. This is a question from Zara Imtiaj. Uh, who's a, a, a journalist in South Asia, uh, asking, is it sustainable to shift to cage-free systems which use higher land area and resources? So, thank you very much for that. This will, this will be very yeah. setting specific, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for that, um, for that question. The answer is probably um, on a global scale, no. Um, in certain locations and rural situations, yes. But on a global scale, no. And that I think is um, why we need to differentiate. And I didn't have time to do it very much in my talk. So, but we need to differentiate a little bit between free range and cage free. So free range is a system where the birds go outside and they have extensive use of land. That on a global scale is almost certainly not going to be sustainable if we want to set aside sufficient land to uh, conserve and restore biodiversity and all the other things we need to do with land. But cage free doesn't necessarily mean free range. Uh, on the last slide that I showed, there was a picture of a multi-tier system for laying hens. And I think it's this sort of system that we're going to see. When we talk about sustainable intensification, I think we do have to think about land use and resource efficiency. So how can we match that with the birds' welfare needs? In a sense, what you have there is a building that's very efficient, like a cage type system, only the birds can move around. So the worst constraint of the cage system has been taken away. The birds can move naturally between the levels, they can find nest boxes, they can go down on the ground and do their foraging and scratching and dust bathing behavior. And yet it's not using any more land than a cage system. So it's a compromise that's bringing all of the drivers together. And can I just follow up on that? There's a, another a linked question really from Anne Connell in, uh, in Hong Kong, who asks, are there studies that are looking at the impact of these types of improvements, whether it's cage free or enriched cages? And what's the impact of that on the livelihood of producers? Yeah, there are studies, there's increasing studies being done because I think there's increasing recognition that we have to look at multiple goals, that just working in silos, working on one area or working on another area isn't going to work. So there are increasing interdisciplinary studies that are looking at the effects of these things on the environment and also on people's livelihoods and the economics of it. Um, 
If you keep birds at a lower stocking density, there are slightly increased costs. But if consumers are willing to pay those slightly increased costs, and it can be marginal for some of these systems compared to a cage system, then the farmer recovers those costs. So, um, so I think that there is a compromise. There's a compromise around those multi-tier ca uh, multi cage free systems that makes them viable for producers and consumers only perhaps have to pay 10%, 15% more than for a cage system. And they're willing to do it. Okay. So Apollina, link, link to that, Barbara Hessler asks whether in low and middle income countries there are incentives for vulnerable producers to help them produce safer food. Um, whether that's through improved welfare or not is irrespective. But moving on to safe food, are there incentives for people to produce safer food? That's a very difficult question. Um, I think the incentives are still um, driven by market opportunities. Um, if you look at, you know, uh, vulnerable producers, they're producing for, you know, sure income. Um, that's for me still the main driver. Uh, there could be some examples that I'm not aware of. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> that's absolutely fine. Uh, sticking with kind of um, safer production, as a question from Ashley Banyard at APHA, um, who says, thank you for your great talks, and that you both mentioned that there's a link between housing methods, infection, and biosecurity. Bearing in mind, we have continued to experience almost annual incursions of avian influenza in the UK, certainly in Europe. What can we do? This is a UK specific question, actually. What can we do to improve our messages around biosecurity and what options might, be, might the future bring to support cheaper methods of biosecurity whilst improving welfare, et cetera? And how can we translate these messages into other settings or countries? I guess one could also ask, are other countries and settings doing it better than we do? Any thoughts on that? Uh, well, shall I start? Um, yeah. So I think so. I think there that that highlights one of the disadvantages again of the of free range production, which taps into this consumer view of natural being important. So one of the reasons that free range systems have expanded to be two thirds of production in the UK is because of this consumer dream really for birds to have a natural life to live outdoors the reality is often not quite as as the consumer imagines there are real problems with birds being outdoors avian flu and exposure to all sorts of other infectious uh, agents to levels of parasites etc are, are not factored in and they're not rated by consumers so I think what we have to do is we have to think that from a biosecurity point of view, generally it's better for the birds, for laying hens or broilers, in fact, to be indoors. If the consumer wants a much higher welfare product, then there are indoor systems that give them natural light and give them protected areas where they can forage. And there are best examples of those come from the Netherlands. The Netherlands is leading the world in the design of really high welfare systems that um, protect birds from biosecurity threats. So I think that's where we have to go. I think we have to challenge consumers' views of natural always being good and perhaps develop a better alignment of what makes for good welfare between what animal welfare scientists and vets think and what consumers think. There's overlap, but there's also divergence. Thank you. Um, Apollo now, we've got a question here from Ruth Alafiatayo. Apologies if I've said that incorrectly. Uh, she says, population growth is a major driver for consumption in sub-Saharan Africa. And po poultry seems to be the easiest way to go for animal source foods. What sort of act actions do you recommend for producers to avoid the mistakes re-welfare that Christine talked about? I think <clears throat> awareness is, is, is really important. And, and I think uh, governments and local authorities have to create incentives, you know, for certification, as it were, for some products, you know, how they are produced. And traceability is also very important. So those are some of the, the things that could be could be put on the table. 
And, and also the, related to what Christian mentioned, free range is, uh, is an important dimension, but there must be boundaries because if it's really open, then you have you know, transmission of diseases and one farm missing with the next one and, and stuff like that. So I think the, 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 there must be some incentives and, and you know, pu the public sector, as I mentioned, is supporting poultry in a big way and governments have to go in and support producers you know, to, 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 to deliver the products to certain standards, which would be acceptable locally, but also globally, because we are looking at international standards. And one of the points that I mentioned earlier is, if you're producing in sub-Saharan Africa for European market or North American market, you also want to make sure that your consumer located in those distant uh, locations should also be conf confident that you produced, you know, that the product that they're consuming has been made um, uh, keeping you know, certain standards. Okay, thank you. We've got lots of questions pouring in. I'm trying to sort of juggle them here. There's a question from, um, from Jane Gibbons, um, which I've just lost, um, which I was gonna highlight. No, I've lost that one, Never mind. Um, let's just have a look. Uh, Yeah, so it's a question from, from Own Ben David here, which is about, you both talked about, or Christine particularly talked about consumers' level of understanding and, and knowledge and, and what, what people think of as being, as being welfare. Um, how much more precise do we, i.e. the scientists, need to be in marketing and promotion of true explanations of, of, of what really is welfare friendly? Yes, I think that we do need to do more. Um, hopefully events like this are just a small start, but I think to reach consumers, um, I think we do need to do more as scientists. So I think that I'm hopeless at engaging with social media, but I think that for younger generations of scientists coming through, I think that's just going to be such an important point. I don't think that we should um, gloss over welfare issues. I think it has to be a, a, a dialogue. We have to understand where consumers are com coming from. And we have to not be shy about telling them about the realities of production and the trade-offs. So consumers also want their food to be highly sustainable. They want it to be safe. They want it to be affordable. And so consumers also have to understand that there will be compromises and there will be trade-offs. But um, sometimes I think there's been a tendency for producers to be quite secretive um, and not want to discuss these issues. And we know from one research study that we did that consumers used the word betrayal they actually used that word when they found out that hens are often beak trimmed to stop the damage done by feather pecking. And they didn't realize that hens were beak trimmed. And when they found that out, they used the word betrayal. We feel betrayed. So I think there is a responsibility to um, provide consumers with much more fair and balanced information. And also, I think the thing that would really, that consumers would really pick up on is understanding things from the bird's point of view. So I think that's where we can really go. If you were a chicken, what would you want? And I think that's where we can go. And we can try to get people to realize that chickens are not small humans with feathers. They are birds, they have needs, they have welfare needs, but they're different from ours. So I think we need to get people to put themselves in the place of chickens much more. Thank you. Um, we're getting uh, close towards the end of our allotted time, but I'm hoping to fit in a couple more questions. There's one here which combines uh, two different uh, questions, actually. So Kelly Watson asks, in Europe, we're trying to move to net zero. How do we balance efficiency versus welfare? For example, broiler, in broilers and broiler breeders. And then Ian Dunn also asks, how do we square the environmental costs of higher broiler, well, broiler welfare? Do we breed to improve modern genotypes or accept a higher environmental impact or, or what's the route forward? So I think both of you could have a go at how do we balance this efficiency, welfare and, and genotypes? <laughs> I'll let a pollinator go first, but I do have something to say. So, <laughs> so um, great questions from my two colleagues there. I think it's, it's important to uh, promote local um, production 
and that should be driven by locally adapted ecotypes. I think that's, you know, that's where you can meet some of the efficiency uh, requirements uh, in terms of feed and the overall uh, production. So that's, that's my view there. And, you know, I want to touch on something that Christine mentioned in the previous question, which is welfare. The issue of welfare is not just for the scientists, it's for everyone involved in the entire value chain. If you look at production, processing and marketing and consumption, you have a very long value chain. The primary producer may have observed very good welfare practices, but the middle man who buys and, pro and slaughter in some places and, and process the product for consumption may violate or negate all those gains made, uh, made initially. So the point I'm trying to make here is that for animal welfare, or, you know, for welfare in this case, it's going to be across the entire value chain because often those who are the primary producer do not carry the responsibility in processing the product and taking it to the marketplace. Thanks, Apollinaire, that's great. The, all I was going to add to this question about the balance between broiler welfare and sustainability is that I don't think that the demands for slower growing poultry um, are going to transform the broiler sector at all. Um, slower growing birds um, will be will use more resources, there's no doubt about it. So I see slower growing birds as a niche product I think that we um, have to breed broiler birds that are perhaps fast growing, but with better legs and better health outcomes, if we're going to supply the bulk of the broiler meat thing. But the other thing that I want to say is that I actually think that, this is where I really put myself on a limb, I think broiler production will decline because I think that the plant-based substitutes are gonna come in and they're gonna be much more resource efficient than the chickens. So in high income countries, I. I might be wrong, but I honestly think plant-based chicken nuggets are going to replace cheap chicken to a large extent and um, slower growing high welfare birds will become a niche luxury product. So prove me wrong, but that's, that's, that's my vision. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that brings us very nicely, actually, to what I thought would be a good closing question. And this comes from uh, our colleague uh, Gautherman in uh, Tamil Nadu, um, who is asking, how do you think that lab grown meat will influence the future of poultry production? So would you like to so, have a thought about that? <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's a bit like the plant. Um, the plant-based meat. The difference at the moment is that the lab-based meat, which has just been approved in Singapore, um, is a lot more expensive at the moment. However, the potential is that it will in fact become uh, cheaper and more resource efficient. So I've looked at the projections. Um, yeah, I would add, I would add lab-based meat in with plant things. I think that in fact we probably won't be producing that many broiler chickens for urban populations in higher income countries when we look 20 years, 25 years to the future. It, when you look at the figures, it just doesn't make sense to do so. Just feed the plant protein in through different systems and feed that to humans and you haven't got any welfare issues to worry about. If you really want your chickens, they're your niche product. But as I say, that's a bit of an iconoclastic view, but it's where it looks like it's going. Apollinaire, a final word from you on this issue. Yeah, on this issue, I think the um, a chicken is not just a source of meat uh, for some of the, in some communities. It's also um, an asset uh, for, other, for other purposes. It's also a social, a cultural value, a valuable asset. So I think I have nothing against uh, lab uh, produced meat, but I think until we get there, we are looking at a, a large segment of our population that will still rely on a bird as a bird producing them and keeping them as assets and disposing them as they need arise. So I think we are lo looking at two different tracks here. And the track I'm really on is really to support those who are most vulnerable, you know, to push them out of poverty and give yeah. them the option to make choices. You know, once they can make yeah. choices because they have buying uh, power, then, you know, uh, everyone will make decision based on, on, a, on a strong point. So that's, that's my closing word there. 
Thank you very much. I really support, I really support your view on that, Apollinaire. We're talking about very different parts of the world and I completely agree with your point. Also a point that's been, been, been put up, uh, which, which I just want to raise is that, is that whilst I, I also agree with, with, with everything that you've said, plant-based products, of course, do have a different nutritional profile to that of animal-based products. And so when you start to look at vulnerable communities, particularly and, 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 and young children, then the, the nutritional profile has to be uh, borne in mind. But anyway, I think we've had a great discussion. Uh, sadly, we, we need to finish. We're getting very close to the end. Uh, so I'd just like to, uh, audience to, on, on the audience behalf to thank you both for this, uh, this really exciting uh, set of discussions. Uh, and there, are, there is a slide which highlights some of the points. Now, this obviously was prepared in advance and the discussion has been wide and ranging, but these are the, the key messages that Apollinaire and, and Christine set out to deliver at the outset, which I think they've really done. So you can read this, you don't need me to read it out, but I think I well, would just highlight that the final point in the list is really what we feel the hub is all about. It's about seeking synergistic solutions so that we can de deliver safe, affordable, welfare, environmentally friendly food. And that's really what we're kind of hoping to achieve and, and be all about with this series as well. Um, I would like now just for the audience, I want to ask you a rather more personal question. At the beginning, we asked you what you thought um, was the uh, level of knowledge in, in your home country about food. This, can you just put up the second poll? This is now a personal response. I'd like you personally to tell us what is the origin of the majority of poultry products that you eat? Is it produced locally? Is it imported or do you not know? It would be really useful to, to know that. So while you're um, completing that poll, I would just like... Uh, one more time to, um, to uh, thank our panelists for their contribution, um, uh, to the tech team who are working in the background to make sure everything runs smoothly, and to you, the audience, for um, your questions and your, your uh, interest in the, in the, in the programme. Please uh, do log on to the Slack channel where uh, all the questions will be posted uh, and people can continue to discuss um, all of the issues. Uh, I think uh, I just want to mention the next event in the series, which will be uh, in 2021. Um, it will be on Wednesday, the 20th of January, and the link will be available very soon to register for this. Um, so do join us when uh, Clarice Ingabar from uh, FAO and Made Setiawan from um, uh, Indonesia will be talking about poultry production, the gender dimension. Um, so. That remains for me now just to say uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, please do stay safe. Can we put the poll up? Yes. OK, so there we are. Um, that's interesting. 90% of you say that you only or that you're the majority of the poultry products you eat is produced locally in your own country. And a very small number of you eat imported food and a very small number don't know the provenance of their poultry. That's really interesting. Thank you very, very much for that. We've got an incredibly well-informed audience, which is great. Uh, so it remains for me to say thanks very much again. Um, if you're taking a break over the forthcoming uh, Christmas period, have a safe, uh, safe vacation or safe staycation. Uh, thank you very much. And do join us again in 2021, where we will continue this series of roadback discussions. So for now, goodbye. <laughs>